Well, the, the most interesting part of what's going on in legal education today is the fact that in one way, in the last 10 or 15 years, and I say in my provincial way, Yale won out. That is, for a long time, Harvard described itself as being a professionally oriented school. It wasn't, you know. Harvard was always a great law school and was always this strange mixture of academic and professional. But they said that they were professional only. And that gave a kind of umbrella for all sorts of less good schools who took them seriously and did nothing but train people to pass the bar. About 15, 20, 30, 25 years ago, and relatively recently, Harvard stopped talking that way and started talking, as we have here for a long time, about this odd combination of academic work and training people to be lawyers, of training citizens, people who will be leaders through the law, but also training lawyers and doing thinking about law. That has meant that the umbrella was removed and all the other law schools, little law schools, who had been kind of following in the Harvard words, not what Harvard really was, have started trying to become more academic. And that's hard because it's, it's easy enough to do it in a place as wealthy as Yale, as wealthy as Harvard, with a kind of faculty, with a kind of students, it's much harder when you come to law schools which have less money, fewer faculty, and are trying very hard to educate a large number of people into the profession. It's made teaching much more interesting so that now there isn't a single law school of the country that doesn't have eight or ten young people who are doing really fascinating work. And it's why going into teaching is much more fun. But what's going to happen at that level of law school is, I think, a challenge. Uh, to me, uh, the connections of law from country to country is... Uh, it's just going to happen. I don't think that's a problem. I mean, you asked what are the biggest... I think that's just a fact. And, uh, you know, I laugh uh, when, uh, uh, when somebody like uh, uh, Justice Scalia, uh, Nino, says, uh, well, why can you, you... How can you cite uh, what uh, happens in uh, other countries in constitutional law uh, when... Uh, or in anything else, from his point of view... Uh, when the judges there have not been appointed by the Senate, uh, by, by the president and confirmed by the Senate. Uh, no, there's something very peculiar about that in a federalism like the United States, where from the very beginning, Connecticut courts cited what Massachusetts or California courts did, uh, even though the judges there were not appointed by the governor of Connecticut or the uh, confirmed by the Senate of Connecticut. In a federalism like ours, reaching out to all the different sources of law and finding the places that were more cognate, more similar, so that uh, Connecticut might cite some things in Ohio because there were connections. New York might cite California because they were both field code states. You would not be bound by, but you'd rely on those things who are approaching that topic in the same way. And you'd also borrow each other's procedures, which way of doing things. Well, the same thing is going to be happening, is already happening now. I mean, a court in Maine may find something in uh, Quebec to be closer to their way of looking at things than something in Texas. Well, this is going to spread all over the world. And it's going to spread in terms of uh, both procedures, techniques, and underlying values. When 
perhaps the opinion that has mine that has been cited most is one saying uh, in a footnote that it would be helpful to the United States if we could develop a doctrine akin to that in the Italian, German, and Austrian constitutional courts of laws heading towards unconstitutionality. The other judges on my court were very old and they were appalled by that. And I put in a footnote, yes, it may be true that we are the mother of constitutional law, but and that these other countries now are our children, but remember, wise parents learn from their children. And that is true in both ways. And it's true not only at the constitutional area where it makes the biggest fuss, but also in areas, other areas of law. You know, if you look at English tort law in the 19th century, they struggled to reach some decisions get to some point because they weren't aware that Lemuel Shaw was doing the same thing 25 years earlier in Massachusetts. If they had known, it would have been much easier. When California put in statistical cause in uh, the cases involving this horrible uh, pharmaceutical that, that caused cancer in the children and so on, they weren't aware that Japan, a common law court, Japan wasn't a common law country, but it did it in a common law way, had done the same thing in an environmental case about 15 years before. I happened to be in Japan at the time it happened, so I knew of it, and if they had known how much easier would it have been, it's inevitable, and it's wonderful. Uh, and with that then comes the coming of students, the movement of professors, and you know, it isn't going to be that different than the way it was during the Middle Ages and the Renaissance when across Europe people could practice law in any country in Europe having studied it in any other. Uh, I think that uh, schools are going to have to come to terms with the fact that their job, one fundamental job, is to figure out the theory of law, to figure out uh, what the ideas properly most interesting are, to tell the truth as they see it, will the heavens fall? Because the heavens don't fall when professors say things, because they can be ignored. This is our great freedom to speak and to say what we believe. That moves us always in a more theoretical direction. Together with that, you have to have the kind of clinical programs the kind of hands-on work on the part of the students so that they don't lose heart, so that they see that the theory which is going to help them be really good lawyers in whatever area of a profession they want has a practical significance and that law remains also a subject always must deal with real people in real situation. That we are um, rigorous by tradition and normative by necessity. And that that plays out in dealing with real human beings. Sometimes people ask me why the clinical program at Yale is so hands-on when Yale is such a theoretical school. And I say, you've just said it. It's because you need both in order to give the right kind of education. And if you make the clinical program sufficiently exciting, you don't need to require it. Students die to get into it, just as they die to get into the courses of the most brilliant and theoretical scholars.